Pete, and um, thanks to Scotty Tweed for putting this event on this evening and running this series of events. I mean, I think it's really important that, um, you know, as we get sort of locked in, that we don't sort of lock ourselves out of mobilising and engaging in our normal activism if in a, a slightly different way, which we're all having to get used to. Um, I think the, the first thing that has to be said is, absolutely is a solidarity from my union to all the frontline workers that are currently one very clearly dealing with the the covid crisis with the um, healthcare and social care system but many many others and i think it's always a slightly bit of a problem once you start getting into lists because you're inevitably going to miss somebody off who's um, very important but i think for my union um, public commercial services union we have got members working away very hard in HMRC, which is Revenue and Customs, um, for those who may not be familiar, and Department for Work and Pensions, dealing with the very excessive demand for universal credit at the moment, and they are going into offices and having to deal with the number of obviously, personal protection issues like everybody else. But another group of workers who really don't get talked about very much in this crisis is actually energy workers. So to sort of link that in to the topic of this particular discussion tonight around energy democracy and just transition, I think it's important to note that we're able, obviously, clearly to have this meeting tonight because there are workers who are still out there keeping our energy system operating across the board. Um, so they're also a very important part of the, the key workers and that enabling our hospitals to function. And we're already seeing in parts of the world very tragically where they've got quite unstable um, power systems, that that's a real threat to their own hospitals and responding to this um, crisis at this time, um, which I'll come back to as, um, as I talk through this a bit. Um, but why energy democracy and why now? Um, it seems a little bit strange at the moment in this immediacy of this crisis that we are still talking about some of these things because obviously we're all i'm sure very preoccupied with figures and what's happening what's particularly happening with the um, tragic circumstances of a lot of workers whether they're actually on the front line dealing with the crisis or seeing themselves um, laid off but I think it's actually become really important and to draw on something which um, I saw Jonathan Neil put in his um, presentation um, around responses to the crisis. Um, one particularly important point that he made is that whilst we're sitting here analysing some of the reasons for it and the, the responses that we make, we have to be active and we can't just wait until we get to the end of it to decide actually what we're going to sort of start saying and um, building around it because I think also aside the, the particular crisis we're in now we have for, for a long period of time been in a political economic crisis and called the climate crisis and that is all going to still be there um, once we're through the worst of this pandemic um, and very clearly the economic crisis is now going to be incredibly severe but it has um, thrown up a number of issues um, which we can sort of relate to and which are now coming out in the sort of wider discussions. But I think perhaps just to say it, in what energy democracy is, because it's a term we use and it means different things in different contexts of different groups, um, but it's a very specific term meaning public ownership of energy and democratic control of our energy system. And we talk about this in PCS as part of a global trade union initiative called Trade Unions for Energy Democracy, um, which we've been part of for a number of years now. They set up in um, 2012 as a response to the lack of inaction around the energy transition that we need to make, and which of course is becoming ever more acute, not least um, given the latest science and the IPPC report in 2018 that more clearly talked about the, the level of sort of rapid and widespread transformation we needed to make across our whole of our economies for the um, energy um, transition. But I think also the other thing, I mean, picking up again from what Jonathan has said, that this is about lives. And in this context, this is still about lives. It's about the lives of workers. It's about the lives of the communities we live in. And we know that the climate crisis is going to have a huge more impact on the majority of people's lives. And sadly, um, not just threatening their livelihoods, but 
also their their existence which we're already seeing and um, in terms of the mass migration so why is public ownership particularly important in the energy transition because one of the things we, we see is that the markets have failed the markets are absolutely failing to deliver the energy transition that we need this has been evident for some time and whilst renewable energy is certainly going up in terms of its composition of the overall energy mix both in the uk and globally it's not happening significantly fast enough and also the level of investment even before this crisis has severely dropped off across the board and that's coming from very sort of um, you know capitalist liberal commentators like bloomberg finance um, and areas like that and we've already seen last year in the um, in Europe, for example, the investment of renewable energy has actually declined, and that was, again was before the, the current crisis we've hit now, and we can expect that to obviously clearly decline further um, as markets become very uncertain about what the, the future is going to look like. But I think it's very evident in what we see in the discussions that we're having daily, you know, through the press and on social media around the ability of our governments within this capitalist framework, for the majority of them, um, to actually respond to the COVID crisis on the basis of the market. We haven't been able to produce the personal protection equipment, we haven't been able to produce the ventilators, and there is a general crisis going on around this. So the, the markets absolutely um, continue to fail to produce the things that um, we need to do. So we need to obviously um, reorder our, our economic systems in a way which become beneficial to our societies and, and really look at the way in which we do everything. Now, I think on December the 12th um, last year, when we had the election results, I was hoping we'd be having very different discussions this year, like many people um, around um, the climate crisis, but particularly around the energy democracy agenda. Not that everything was suddenly going to fall into place and be perfect if we'd have had a Labour government, but certainly they were starting to talk about some of the things we've been campaigning on for a number of years, that we need to take back the entirety of our energy system into um, public ownership and democratic control. And when I say the entirety of the energy system, I talk about the power sector here, just so to be clear. Um, so electricity, not, not gas, which is a whole different issue. Um, but that's we, we talk about the power sector particularly because that's where we need to decarbonize the fastest at the moment and is the, the biggest emitters of obviously co2 emissions but um i kind of did think on after december the 12th well, where now do we go for this energy democracy agenda clearly we have a conservative government that's been hell-bent on liberalization deregulization and privatization of the energy system and just about everything else, although not exclusively, obviously we've seen that on some periods of the Labour leaderships as, as well under the Blair government. But um, So it all felt very depressing, but interestingly enough, um, whilst this is not the kind of crisis that you want to um, be having to be developing some of these discussions, there is much more wider discussions going on about nationalization as, as people are talking about it but um around public ownership in general and we very specifically talk about public ownership and not nationalization that might seem quite a nuanced thing to say but it's because we're not talking about a return to a sort of white or bureaucratized model of ownership of the energy system we are talking about different forms of devolved ownership um across the board and how that what we call worker participation within the energy system which would look very different to what we've known in the past we're also not talking about community energy and i can come back to that in questions why we're not particularly talking about community energy now we're not saying that public ownership or state ownership becomes a panacea to solve everything of course it doesn't um, and that's why the democratic control is very important in this but also part of this agenda is changing how we view energy and what we use energy for. So we often talk about the supply side, so whether we need coal, whether it's renewable energy. But for us, it's very important to talk about the demand side, reducing the demand side and linking that into seeing energy as a public service, seeing energy as a public good, um, not something to be made um, profits out of that we all need. It's hardwired throughout all of our systems it's enabling us to have this meeting tonight so 
it's very important we see it in its broader context, not just what we generate in terms of whether it's renewable or fossil fuels, but how we're using energy and why we're using energy and who is using energy and therefore who controls all of that and how we input into it. So therefore, once we start talking about that, it also addresses issues of fuel poverty and energy poverty. Um, energy poverty is different to fuel poverty. Energy, is your general, energy poverty is your general access to energy, which in large parts of the world, over around half of the world's population, do not have access to energy. Um, whereas obviously in the UK context, um, we talk more about fuel poverty as, as people's ability to actually be able to afford to pay for their energy um, the energy bills. As I said, we talk about it as a system. So it's from generation to transmission to distribution to supply. Um, and that's very important. And again, the Labour Party weren't talking about public ownership of the overall energy system when they were having those discussions, although the, the main focus was on transmission and distribution and they did bring supply into it. Um, I've mentioned about energy being part of a public good, um, a public service. Um, and it's about um, also about how we see energy across the whole of the economy. So it's about having a whole economy approach to energy. So it's not just about run the electricity for our homes. It's about how we design our cities. Um, one thing, again, we've seen this current crisis, there's actually been a drop off in demand for electricity because we've all changed the way that we're currently living and working. Um, so those sort of peaks in demand in the morning and industrial demand has all dropped off. I mean, clearly that is likely to change if we just all return to business as usual, though I'm not suggesting we'd all want to stay sort of locked up in our homes clearly and working from home in the way in which we have been for the past few weeks. But um, just that drop off also around our transport systems. So given that if we talk about electric vehicles and electric cars, I think that puts somewhere around 20% more energy demand on the overall capacities that we already have. And then if you build onto that also um, things around electric heating as well. So um, the other thing about public ownership, which we've not really um, talked about very much, is actually around human rights side. Um, even with renewable energy, obviously we have to source lots of earth minerals from parts of the world where there's already large um, human rights violations around the extractivist economy, um, and that continues to happen. But we see human rights violations here off our own shores in the UK, and some of you may be familiar with the concerns that the RMT offshore workers side of the union have raised with the use of um, foreign labour, which is um, not EU migrants, but is a lot of it's from uh, labour from Asia and Africa, which are paid under, they're brought in under visa waivers and paid um, below national pay rates. Um, so it's a, a complete exploitation of offshore labour in the offshore wind energy sector. And a lot of these issues are starting to be brought to the, the fore quite, um, quite more readily now than what they have been for a long time, which is really important. But I mean, the, 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 the big thing there is that coming back to what I was saying at the beginning is that given the, the need to rapidly decarbonize our economies, we know that the private sector isn't doing this, the privatized model isn't working in terms of what we need to achieve in the energy transition overall. And it's only at a level of national level of coordination that we believe that we'll be able to make the transformations that we need to make very quickly. Um, and obviously now we're talking about by the end of this decade, by 2030, to get to zero carbon emissions. And only the government has the ability to coordinate and, and do that. But we're not saying, that, again, that it should be done under the previous models of nationalisation that um, we, we've understood, but in a very different formulation of that. And the other critical thing for us clearly in as being a trade union is that we also think it's the only way which we will facilitate a proper just transition um, for workers in the sector and across the whole economy and link it between looking about what we need to do from every, everything. So it's not for us, the, the just transition isn't just about an energy transition. It is about what happens in construction. It is about what happens in transport. It happens it is about what happens across the whole of our public services as well, which is a, a very important point to it. Now, a few weeks ago, 
we wouldn't have believed that we could be seeing some of the changes that we are seeing now and things that are being done very, very rapidly. Um, we've always been told, and this has been very much at the heart of a lot of trade union discussions, so why the broad principle of energy democracy is supported across the trade union movement in the UK. Um, the principles about how we get there and the arguments about fossil fuels and renewables still actually um, pertain that we, we, we don't have a consensus on that across the trade union movement and obviously particularly with those unions that are more vested in those members directly in the energy sector. But we have seen a lot of strange things happening in the past couple of weeks in terms of government responses and actually how even private corporations are responding to some of um, the challenges that have been faced and in the energy networks for example they have had I mean they always have contingency planning for blackouts and stuff like this but they met um, quite early in March to talk about the Covid crisis and how they would obviously keep the energy system operating so in terms of the transmission distribution networks particularly and one thing they're talking about is retraining of workers. They're talking about sharing of en engineers across different networks. Um, so they're, they're actually talking about and recognizing that they are in natural monopolies. And that's another important reason for us why energy particular we think should be under public ownership. It is a natural monopoly. It could be disagreed in terms of the generation side, but particularly around the transmission and distribution side. Um, there is only one grid. That is obviously there are the networks that come off of that into the distribution side, but they are again natural monopolies, and therefore we could better coordinate across all of this if we had one single energy public owned company, if you like, um, but overall under public ownership. Um, so that's the other thing. I mean, obviously, as well with this crisis, it's not just in terms of the investment in the markets for energy that are enormous supply chain issues now happening right across the renewable sector um, as well um, which is obviously going to have an impact in the longer term which nobody's quite clear about just yet in terms of the um, provision of the materials for renewable energy um, a lot of that which is obviously coming from Asia at the moment so and the the other side um, to talk about the just transition side, um, particularly, and what, what, why we have the, the link between that. I think it's, it's very important, obviously, for the trade unions working specifically in the energy sector, mainly in Unite and GMB and Unison to some extent, um, it's very clearly for them to decide and have those conversations with their workers about what a just transition looks like and they have produced documents around that. For us, we feel the whole just transition narrative doesn't go far enough. It's become very depoliticized um, and including through the TUC and the, these are things which we say quite openly in these meetings because it has to be a transformative transition. It's not Justice for workers is absolutely key, of course, and all the things that we normally call for in a just transition, we will remain to call for alongside all the other trade unions in terms of social protections and workers' rights, consultation. But we think if we're not having a transition, if we're just having what we have tended to call a, a green catalyst job swap from the fossil fuel economy into the renewables economy, then really nothing changes. And again, what's happened over the past few weeks has exposed what, of course, we already knew of the very precariat nature of our economy, which, and the precariat use of the workforce. I mean, we're seeing this in offshore oil at the moment, where they have always used the oil downturns to shed loads of workers, but they're equally using the COVID crisis right now to get rid of lots of contract workers. And we're, again, we're seeing this right across swathes of the economy. So we know that we are heading for an enormous economic crisis once we get out of this public health crisis, um, probably which is going to be worse than 2007, 2008 financial crisis. What has become very clear is the kind of very public narrative around this of recognizing who the real wealth creators and the social wealth creators are in our society and the important jobs that are being done in our society and I don't think there's going to be an opportunity for the, the, 
the, the politicians to come and bail out the bankers or the airlines and it's interesting how cautious they're being about that at the moment um, and to be, be turned to but we've actually seen the kind of very rapid drop off across the whole of the, the markets which we have been told which I, I think was the, the point I didn't quite finish earlier is that even just a month ago that we couldn't have the kind of transition that we need and the rapid transformation of the economy to reach the 2030 targets because exactly what we're seeing now would happen well we're now living that and we have been living it in any case but it shows what we can do and i i, I don't really like the term political will but um but if if we can actually get past that sort of block of the, the markets needing to be in control of what we, we can achieve and see what we can achieve. And the International Labour Organization re released a report today, they've been keeping quite a close um, global analysis of the jobs that are being lost across the board. And you know, it's not surprising to say millions and millions of workers are being put out of work. But if you see that in the UK, we, they were already reporting at the beginning of the year, we're moving towards a more informalized jobs market in the UK, um, not just with zero hours contracts, but short term working and all the rest of it, which you tend to see more in the global south, that we're actually starting to mirror that quite a lot. So there is this argument for a green new deal but a global green new deal and a socialist um, green new deal which we absolutely need coming out of this crisis and to start formulating um, the demands around that and building the pressure for that from trade unions and allies within obviously groups and activists particularly operating around the, the climate space as well and and to understand that the, the kind of collective response that we should have to this now Another thing I don't particularly like is war analogies, but there's a lot of that happening at the moment in references to what happened after World War II. So I think I will just um, perhaps just finish um, this contribution with, if we're going to look at what came out of World War II in the creation of the welfare state and the National Health Service, then I think one thing that we would clearly be demanding, which is come straight out of the One Million Climate Jobs campaign in which we have supported, is the creation of a national climate service and let's really put this on paper and start developing a civil service so from our perspective of a civil service trade union a civil service that is actually geared up to respond to the climate crisis and let's create a just transition commission that probably works um, with building a new industrial strategy for zero carbon economy that's based on public ownership particularly of energy and linked into our transport strategies, our construction strategies, our education strategies as well and let's develop also the social security and social protection scheme for our Department for Work and Pensions for example that actually is there about supporting workers through the transition not there to penalise them or give them sanctions and actually building a proper security net that really enables workers to retrain, go into education or preferably not retire early, but in some cases where they want to without a loss of benefits, even at the moment with the job retention schemes and things like this, workers are only going to get about 30% of their income compared to other countries, where even on a, without a crisis, will be given 60 to 80% of their incomes um, for a year when facing situations of unemployment. But it's that level of investment that's going to be need to put in with a really joined up program across the board so if we are going to have any spirit of 45 then i think it is to actually be very bold and very ambitious and build these demands across the board and get everybody active and understanding why these are important for the current crisis we're in but also for the, the global economic and particularly the climate crisis that we we have to respond to so i'll just finish there thank you